Thank you very much indeed for, for that kind introduction. I too am going to employ the egg timer. I can't imagine what kind of an egg you might want to time with that, maybe an albatross or something. Um, but as long as it's accurate, that's the main thing. It's a great pleasure to, to be able to uh, be here this evening and to, to share a few reflections arising from my work, including, as was just said, my most recent book, What Nature Does for Britain, which is, is published this month. I've been involved with different aspects of the environmental debate now for over 30 years, and I've campaigned, researched, been a policy analyst, I've done communications, I've worked on strategy across the whole range of issues, climate, sustainable agriculture, biodiversity, water, energy, and all the rest. And I'm happy to say, in looking back over those three decades, actually quite a lot has changed in some really quite positive ways. It may not always seem like it as we walk around London, but we enjoy air and water quality, which are now better than any time since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. If you look back over the last 50-odd years of conservation work across the world, there's now something like 10% of the world's land surface is protected for the conservation of, of biodiversity, up from 1% uh, at the beginning of the 1960s. Some of the technologies that we've been talking about for years are beginning to get scale, Costs are falling, installation is rising, solar and wind power being two global cases in point. And yet, if you look at all of the critical trends that we need to arrest if we're going to finish up with what you might describe as a green society, then pretty much all of them are still heading in the wrong direction, both at the national level and globally. So the build-up of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is a very well-known phenomenon that's continuing, despite the agreements being talked about at the global level and the extent to which we are now beginning to deploy cleaner energy technologies. If you look at the rate of extinction taking place on the Earth right now, we're going through a period possibly unprecedented since the time the dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, such as the impact of our agriculture, pollution and demand for land. And then if you look at critical resources that are vital for continuing development, healthy soils, fish stocks and fresh water availability, all of these things are showing signs of serious stress as well. So there's a real paradox here. Considering the level of scientific knowledge that we now have and the technological capability that we've got, why are we still going in the wrong direction when we know that we could be doing so much better? This, I think, is the critical question for environmentalists in this period we're now in. And I've devoted quite a lot of my time over the last few years to thinking through what the real problem is compared to what the symptoms are. And for me, the big problem is a major disconnection between the disciplines of ecology and the work of economists. These two things have gone in opposite directions. And you can see symptoms of this the whole time, basically putting across the point to society that actually looking after nature is too expensive, it gets in the way of economic growth, it's a barrier to job creation and is harming our competitiveness. And that particular theme has become particularly embedded in the age of austerity. You can see it all the time, all around us. The Prime Minister's alleged instructions to his aides about a year ago to get rid of all the green crap. That was one. Another can be seen in the so-called Environment Secretary standing up for pesticides companies who want to keep in circulation toxic substances that destroy bumblebee colonies and indeed other insects. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer's remarkable claim that the European Union's Habitats Directive is, he described, as a ridiculous burden on business. You start adding all of this up and you can see a powerful brick wall of anti-environmental narrative predicated on the idea that looking after nature somehow gets in the way of promoting the interests of people. So I spend quite a lot of my time at the moment writing about this and marshalling the evidence to show that actually the opposite is in fact the case. And not only is nature not a barrier to development, but actually healthy nature is essential for protecting our health, wealth and security into the future. And there's an incredibly rich body of evidence out there that shows us why that is the case. I start what nature does for Britain with a view out of the International Space Station window. I wasn't there, but fortunately a video camera was with astronauts looking at our country literally exactly a year ago, just after we had that very heavy rain. And you see around the coast of the British Isles this incredible brown colour. And this 
it turns out, is soil that's left the farmland and is now in the sea because of the way in which we farm. Now, soil is one of those environmental assets that you can't overestimate the value of. Not only is it responsible in this country for producing three quarters of our food that we can grow here, some of the rest we import, some we catch in the seas around us, not only is the soil doing that job, it is also helping to secure our water supply, and healthy soils are also helping to reduce flood risk. And on top of that, billions of tonnes of carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere are being held in healthy soils. That brown fringe that you can see from 300 kilometres up in space should be sending alarm bells ringing around the political establishment in this country because that asset is being literally destroyed as a result of how we've chosen to line up the economics of agriculture. And it's not just from agricultural soils that we get these incredibly valuable benefits. Semi-natural soils underneath different kinds of habitats are delivering huge dividends for the country as well. During the course of writing What Nature Does for Britain, I've visited Dartmoor with some experts from some water companies and nature conservation agencies to look at work going on up there to restore the blanket bog. Now, that blanket bog has been accumulating for the last 8,000 years or so underneath a living layer of sphagnum mosses. It's locking up hundreds of millions of tons of carbon that would otherwise be changing the climate, but also it's soaking the water into this living sponge and then releasing it into the rivers in a way which enables them to flow cleanly and evenly. But that area of moorland, many people have regarded for decades as wasteland, rather than, as is really the case, an essential piece of strategic infrastructure for the country, and in this case, the southwest of England. And for decades, the place has been literally abused. And so in the 19, uh, early 1900s, Royal Navy battleships stationed in Plymouth Sound used to use the top of the moor for target practice, firing 16-inch diameter shells out of the sea 20 miles up to Dartmoor, blowing the peat to pieces. The abuse continued with army rangers being sighted up there using artillery, and then on top of that, the place has been set alight deliberately and accidentally, and the place has been drained in order to enable sheep to get on there. This has destroyed the blanket bog, and because it was wasteland, nobody really paid much attention to the consequences except when you look at the price of water, hot political topic. The water's being made more expensive downstream because the colour that was once being held in the blanket bog is contaminating the water, requiring millions of pounds of expense to get it out again. And where does that expense go? Of course, to all of us in our water bills. People are also seeing their insurance premiums going up because flood risk is being increased as a result of the way in which the bog is no longer being the sponge that it used to be. And then, of course, we're all going to pay in the end for the consequences of climate change, as that peat literally evaporates as the carbon in the unrotted plant remains unites with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. The ground is literally turning into thin air. The narrative I present in What Nature Does for Britain is, however, not gloomy. It's very optimistic. And actually, one of the things I've found as an environmental campaigner for quite a long time is that pessimism is the shortest route to defeat. And if we are going to be able to create some sense of possibility around all of this, then showing what can be done is as important as showing what's going wrong. And in this case and many others, the restoration of ecosystems is proving to be a very effective and very cost-effective way of doing a number of things that society needs. So by protecting the bog, which is what Southwest Water are now doing, they can push the price of water down for people who are getting the bills. By protecting the bog, millions of tons of water stays in the hills rather than running off, which means people's houses don't get flooded, meaning that insurance premiums can be managed into the future. And as we're arguing about the pros and cons of nuclear power, solar and wind, and all these technologies that do cost some money, that bog is locking up the carbon for absolutely nothing. If we protect the bog, then of course we get all the benefits that come with this in terms of recreation and of course the conservation of rare birds, animals and plants that live up there. And it's not only for soils that we depend on food, pollinating insects, insects are the controlling pests, bringing huge value to the country's economy. One scientist who I spoke to who was looking at the value of pollinators to the UK believes that they're worth about a half a billion pounds per year in free services being delivered by animals like bumblebees. 
I visited one company, uh, Thatcher's Cider, to go and speak to them about what they saw of all of this. This company is a British business success story. 25% annual growth year on year over the last seven years, turning over 60 million pounds a year. I went and spoke to the managing director. He's a smart businessman. Great brand he's managing, lots of new technology being brought in, great marketing, great supplier relations. But then I, when I spoke to him, what is the most fundamental asset behind this fantastic company turning over so much money for UK PLC? The answer is bumblebees. No bumblebees, no pollination, no pollination, no apples, no apples, no cider, no thatchers. This is another company like Southwest Water that's understood this and is now replanting areas of grassland that were previously lost, ramping down the amount of chemicals they're using and trying to restore some of the ancient hedges where the bumblebees breed. And on top of that, where pest controllers like bats and owls also live. A sound economic business rationale lying behind the kinds of things that our political establishment are telling us we can't afford. It's nonsense. And then perhaps you get to the biggest political issue of all in terms of health and the future of this country's uh, well-being from the point of view of public health trends. We know we've got big problems. By the 2050s, it's expected that something like 40% of under 16-year-olds will be obese. That's going to cost us in the order of 45 billion pounds per year. And then we have rising difficulties linked with mental ill health, anxiety, depression, range of other conditions. That's already costing us about 105 billion pounds per year. Some of that's seen in costs falling to the health service. What we do know, and I spoke to many of the scientists who've been doing this work, that one of the most effective, cost-effective, and most accessible ways of combating many of these trends is to enable people access to nature, to wild areas, to woods, to coastline, to riverbanks, bird watching, walking, taking the dog out, relaxing, this has a hugely beneficial effect that translates into some really big numbers in terms of our country's economic future. One piece of work done by Natural England, an advisor to the government, suggests that every pound invested in good quality walking schemes, getting people outside, it pays seven pounds back in avoided health costs that would fall otherwise to the National Health Service and employers. When you start adding all of this up, you start to generate some truly huge numbers. There's one that sticks in my mind from the Office of National Statistics, published a couple of years ago. They were tasked by the government to go and work out roughly what this country's natural assets might be worth. Our grasslands, our mountains, our woodlands, our shorelines, and our rivers are looking at all the different things they provide, and actually not including public health significantly, but even excluding some of these services and some of these ecosystems, they still came up with a number uh, of 1.5 trillion pounds. That's the value of these natural assets that we're told we have to liquidate in order to be able to achieve growth and competitiveness. And that 1.5 trillion pound figure, you may have noticed in listening to recent political debates, is the size of this country's fiscal deficit. And yet we're breaking our necks to create economic growth in a way which is going to put more pressure on those assets in the longer term, making us poorer, and in my opinion, threatening our long-term health, wealth, and security. Because this country's biggest asset for the long term is healthy nature, because it leads to a healthy economy and to healthy people. And for all the writing that I've been doing in recent years, it seems to me now, the argument that we have to win for a secure and sustainable future is not so much that nature is beautiful, and should be protected for its own sake. I certainly believe that, and that's why I've been getting up every day for the last 30 years making the case. But in addition to being beautiful, in addition to being wondrous, in addition to being spiritually essential for human well-being, on top of all of that, 100% of our economy depends upon healthy nature. It is the height of insanity, in my opinion, to see the depletion of nature as a means of achieving economic growth when we're only measuring one element of that, growth in GDP, whilst nobody's measuring the decline in natural systems. And this is why I'm quite excited and quite optimistic about the future, because this penny is beginning to drop. There are now economists beginning to work out not only how we can value nature, but also how we can protect it for the long term, including through economic signals and including through legislation. 
And my new book hopefully will make a small contribution to pushing that ball a little further down the road in presenting a manifesto for politicians in the run-up to the general election. And the centerpiece of what I'm calling for is a new nature and well-being act, an act of parliament to organize the country's resources so that the masses of money we're spending on our water bills, on farm subsidies, on flood protection, we can harness all of that for much better outcomes. Because at the moment, we're paying three times. We pay the farmers to trash the soils, we pay to have all the rubbish taken out again, and then we pay bigger insurance premiums as the riverbeds fill up with soil. That is not a rational way to go. And if there is any rationality in how evidence meets policy, hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll start to see some joining up because nature, in the end, is the ultimate source of our health, wealth, and security. Thank you very much indeed.